call this disorder disorder. Oh no. Um, all right, so we're, we're proceeding now that we've got through what will be the worst day for a while for you guys with all those proofs yesterday. And we're proceeding to want to be able to actually use derivatives for things. So the first step is to have the basic rules for multivariable derivatives that you guys had in single variable calculus. So for example, if f and g are mapping some open set of Rn to Rm, are differentiable at A, then what do you think I can say about the sum of those two vector functions? Also are we not charged? It'll be fine. It's just it's gonna be cut and close. We'll be okay though. Okay. And F plus G is differentiable at A. And the derivative of the sum is what you all think it is. So the derivatives. And actually, you can easily prove this from the limit definition for what it means to be differentiable. You put this candidate in for the derivative, and you just check that the error does in fact go to zero. Not going to belabor it. What else can I do with two functions that are mapping to Rm? Composition. No, I can't do composition yet. Multiply. How, what do you mean by multiply? You can dot I can dot them. So I can look at f dot g, which I just made super confusing by putting <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Okay. Then the, then the dot product is differentiable. And now, I, if I want to write down a formula for how I take the derivative of the dot product, I have to be a little bit careful here. So it, it is a product rule, like you would expect. But I don't know how to dot vectors with matrices. So I really have to put in what the value is on a vector. If I want to know what the derivative of the dot product is evaluated on V, it's going to be df at A applied to V, namely the directional derivative of F in the direction of V, dotted with G plus F dotted with the directional derivative of G. So that's the product rule. I can't divide vectors. Similarly, there's a product rule if you have a scalar function that's differentiable can do the, the standard product rule. Um, if m, this is something we're actually going to use in a couple of days, so I want to say it. In the case where you're mapping to R3, what can, what can you do with two vectors in R3? You can do cross product. So you can take the cross product of two vectors in R3, and if those are differentially varying vectors, then the cross product is. And there's a comparable formula. But you guys might be slovenly in the way you write your product rules. In, in all your calculus experience and you've taken the derivative of a product, have you paid attention to which order you write things? Nah, you just do it any way you want. But when you're doing so with vectors and with matrices, order matters. So I have to be careful that I keep the order of f and g the same when I write out the product rule here. It's going to be the derivative of f in the direction of v cross the value of g plus f and a cross 
the direction of the root of the g in the direction. So it's important to keep the order the same. In a couple of days, we're actually going to be talking about Kepler's laws, and I'm actually going to use this explicitly. Okay. So somebody in the peanut gallery wanted me to talk about composition of functions, and that's the one I really care about. So the most important one that takes some mentioning here is the setup where you're mapping open set in Rn to Rm, and then there's some function mapping to Rl, and you want to compose function. So this is the So if I have a composition of functions, the chain rule is what tells me how to take the derivative. So if f is di differentiable at a, and g is differentiable at what point? f of a. F of a probably should have switched f and g, because most of the applications are going to have them switched. Oh, well. Then, the composition. Now, the composition I've been writing in the past when we were doing continuity, I wrote fog, but now it's going to be what? Oh. It's going to be golf. It's differentiable at a. And what do you think the best linear approximation of a composition should be. Intuitively, the best way to get the best linear approximation to two functions composed is to compose the best linear approximations. So the chain rule says exactly that. It says that it's dg at f of a composed with df a. And as I say, we're probably going to write this formula down with letters in different orders, and it's not a big deal. You just need to make sure that what you're writing makes sense. Right? You're always wanting to do composition where the inner function gets fed into the outer function. And then the derivatives similarly compose. So I want to do a bunch of examples of this. If there's a little extra time later in the week, I may give you an idea of a proof of that, but I'm not going to do it today for sure. Okay, so I want to, so I want to talk about some examples of the chain rule. So suppose, for example, that you have a function on R3. And one of my favorite things to give as an example here is to say, say that f of x, for example, is the temperature at position x. And let's assume for purposes of this discussion, that it's not depending on time. So, this is not realistic. In, 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 rea in reality, temperatures vary both with position and with time, but I'm going to ignore the time for now. And so, here we are in three space, and at each point there's a nice temperature, and we're going to assume that this is a differentiable function. And here's what I propose that you ponder for a minute. 
imagine that Along comes a bumblebee flying along some path. <coughs> no, it's not just going this path. Oh, okay. Sorry, I should color him a little better here. Okay. I have more like a bumblebee. So the bumblebee is flying along this path. And let's say the position of the bumblebee, just to make you confused, is g of t. So this is the position of the bumblebee at time t. So this is a very sophisticated bumblebee. And in his mouth, he's carrying a thermometer. <laughs> Does he have a fever? Mm -hmm. Does he have a fever? Is that why he's... Right. <laughs> he, he, want, he wants to be sure he doesn't have Ebola. <laughs> <laughs> Shouldn't joke. So the question is, as the bumblebee flies, what's the tip? He's actually taking the temperature of the outside, not of himself. What's the temperature at the point that the bumblebee's at? Well, at time t, he's at the point g of t. So we're going to do f of g, now back to fog. The, the temperature at the point g of t is the temperature that the bumblebee is measuring as he flies around. Temperature measured by the bumblebee as a function of time. And so what's the obvious question to ask? What's the rate of change? What's the rate of change? So this should bring back all sorts of favorite memories for you guys from doing related rates problems in calculus. You're going to have a few of them now showing up here. But I want you to use the stuff we're learning in this course to do it. So the, the standard question is going to be, what's the derivative with respect to t of the temperature at the bottom of the middle? Now, I'm going to use the prime notation here when there is a single independent variable t. So, Computational convention here, we use prime only when we have one independent variable. I have a single time variable. So I'm not thinking of this as a derivative matrix here. I'm thinking of this as a regular derivative as a, of a real value function. Right, so here's the setup. You have the temperature function here, and you have the path of the bumblebee. Almost have a good musical pun going there. <laughs> Got two chuckles, so I guess not bringing people right in that. So you're, when we compose here, we're doing a function of time. So I just mean regular, old-fashioned, single variable derivative. Here. I'm not going to write capital D for that. So what does the chain will tell me? What is the derivative of fog? Well, I take the derivative mapping of f and feed into it the derivative mapping of g. That's what the chain will says. So I take the derivative of f at the point g of t. Now that's going to be a what by what matrix here. One by three. One by three. One by three. And I multiply it by the derivative of g, which is a vector that's three by one. And so the output, again, is a one-by-one one matrix, which we identify with a real number.
What does this remind you of? What does this formula remind you of? Derivative f at a point applied to vector. Oh, it's the directional derivative. This is the directional derivative. This is the directional derivative of f at the point g of t in the direction of So if I go back to my picture with the bumblebee, which I'll just draw again to make it a little easier, wherever the bumblebee is, where g prime of t represents the, the velocity vector. So let's say we're at a time t naught here. And this is the position vector g of t naught. This is the velocity vector, namely the rate of change of the position with respect to time. And you're computing the derivative of f at the point g of t naught, so that's the point that we're at, in the direction of the vector v, where v is the velocity of the bubble v. So that makes perfectly good sense if you think about directional derivatives. Right? When we talked about directional derivatives, we said, that's the rate of change of f at this point as you move it with this velocity in a certain direction. Now you're going to complain to me what? What are you going to complain? When we, when we thought about directional derivative, how did we think about it? Derivative along a what? Is that bumblebee flying on a line? No. So why should it be the same? Well, not exactly the same. Why should it be the same to imagine that the bumblebee were, were flying along a straight line in that direction versus actually doing what he's doing, which is flying along this curving curve? Because you're taking it instantaneously. You're taking it instantaneously. Instantaneously, flying along this curve with this velocity vector is instantaneously the same straight thing line. as if you were flying on a straight line. To first order, doing derivatives, you only see what's happening up to linear issues. You don't care about how this curve is curving unless you start doing higher order derivatives. Mm -hmm. um, just really quick, why on the, using, on the things up there like the f plus g, f dot g, f cross g, why is the v there for two of them and not for the other one? Because I didn't know how, in the first one I'm just saying add two matrices. Okay. I didn't know, if I had left out the V's, I would have had to multiply an M by N matrix. I would have to dot an M by N matrix with a vector in M space, and I don't know what to do. Okay. I, don't, I don't know what that means. So that's why I put the V's in, so I get vectors. Thank you. Okay, so what, what I do want to emphasize here is that if I give you that the derivative of f at a certain point is a certain linear map. And I tell you that you have a certain path so that at time t naught you're at the point a, and the derivative of g the velocity vector for this path is 1, 7, negative 3, you have enough information to compute the derivative of the composition. You don't need to know everything about f or everything about the path. 
if all you want to know is the rate at which the bumblebee's temperature is changing is when he's at this point, all you need to know is what's the derivative of f at that point and what direction is the bumblebee flying at that point. You don't need any more information. Similarly, you may not have had this stress when you took beginning calculus. When you did related rates problems and they said the balloon is moving up at a certain rate, how fast is the person's eyes, how fast is the angle of the eye, what's that called, the angle of elevation or something. At what rate is the angle that the person watching the balloon, at what rate is the person having to lift his eyes in order to follow the path of the balloon. You don't need to know anything about the path of the balloon other than at that moment that you're talking about, it's going up at a certain rate. That's all you need to figure out d theta dt. You, you don't need to say, oh, I have to write down the path of the balloon for all time. And that's something I always want to emphasize here. That don't assume anything in the problem that isn't given to you. So don't assume that the bumblebee is flying on a straight line and write down the function of t for the straight line. You don't get to assume that. But you do know by the chain rule that you have enough information. You don't need to say, oh, well, then g of t is some explicit function. You don't know what that is, and I'll take off if you tell me that you do know. If you write me an essay about how the answer is going to be the same by the chain rule, so you're going to compute it for that case, I'll say, sure, but why go through all that extra work when all you needed was the chain rule in the first place? Right, so this is going to be the derivative of f at the point a times the vector g prime of t naught, because at time t naught, g is at the point where you know the derivative of f. So this is going to be exactly the matrix product, derivative matrix multiplying by vector of the velocity. How much? Negative 16. Yeah, I agree. So just to drive home this point before I do some other examples, I want to return to our favorite crusty friend, the anteater. <clears throat> so here we are, say in the plane, and we have our friend, the anteater, sitting at the origin. have an ant over here. And my question is going to be, if you know at a certain moment that the ant is at this point and he's moving, say, southeast, so at, at t equals zero, the ant is at 5, 1, and moving southeast with speed 3. So instantaneously, I'm telling you that his velocity vector looks something like this. But I'm not telling you he's moving on a straight line. In fact, I know for a fact that the ant was out drinking too late last night. <laughs> and he's doing some crazy wobbly path. And my question is, at t equals 0, at what rate is the ant's distance <coughs> from the anteater? changing at that moment. So 
we should be a little bit more specific, I suppose, and put meters per second. That's a pretty fast ant. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what's that like? Centimeters per second. It's still a still, it's still, still pretty fast. Still fast. Yeah. It's All right, millimeters. <laughs> It's a slow. All right. It's a big ant. I got it. No. Meters per hour. <laughs> Three meters per hour is okay. And these are measured in meters. So, when I ask about what rate is the distance changing, what are we going to have? Well, let's think about that in a minute. All right, so I don't want you doing it the way you would have done it in high school or in baby calc. I want to actually use the stuff we've been doing. So I'm asking the ant's distance from the ant eater. What is that? Magnitude or magnitude. So if the ant's position is given by some function of t, you could imagine that that's the vector from the origin to the ant. And so what I'm interested in is what function of x? Oh, that's square root. Don't say square root. Absolute. Don't say absolute value. Absolute. Magnitude of x. And we have information that at time 0, the ant is at the point 5,1. And his velocity at that moment is what? Three meters. Be careful. It's the square root of 3 this way and the square root of 3 down. What? So southeast. So unless I gave you a more specific compass bearing, I mean literally 45, 45 degree angle there, right? So what's the vector going to be? What's a vector that goes southeast? 2 over square root of 2. 1 minus 1. 1 negative 1. But that isn't a unit vector. So I can make it be a unit vector, method of wishful thinking, by dividing by square root of 2. But then I want it to have length 3. 3. So I take 3 divided by the square root of 2 times this vector. That has the correct length and is pointing in the correct direction. Now, what do we want? We want to know the derivative of fog again at time zero. How are we going to do it? Chain rule. Chain rule. Very good. By the chain rule, this is derivative of f at g of zero applied to the vector g prime of zero. Well, I know g prime of zero, and I know g of zero. What I don't know is df. I don't even need partial derivatives. You guys just did this in homework. You just turned it in. From problem A, you, you just turned in, you showed that the derivative of ma the magnitude x function at a point A was, well, you showed that that on h was A dot h over magnitude h, over magnitude a. Right, you showed that this gave the correct best linear approximation by doing your algebra, and I think, I hope most of you got it. So what does that tell us that the derivative is? Just by the way, I mean, I already know what I need to do the problem, but if this is the directional derivative in direction h, but I want a 1 by C 
something matrix. Yeah. Uh, 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 is it uh, X component X X X X X X X X What do I do with this to make it be a, a, a linear map rather than having a dot product here? I want a one by something matrix. This is a vector that goes that way. Transpose it. If you turn the vector on its side, that gives you the linear map. Okay, so let's finish. I have df at g of 0, that's 5, 1. And then I'm applying it to the vector here. So again, you could use the dot product formula, it doesn't, doesn't matter. What's df at 5, 1? 5 over root 26. 1 over root 26, right, the magnitude of A. Wait, why 1? Oh, no, I'm, not, I'm just doing this so far. Okay. And then 5, 1 turned on its side, right? Okay. That's the derivative matrix. And then I'm multiplying by the scalar multiple of 1, negative 1. So I've, I've got 3 over square root of 26, square root of 2, times what? Um, what do I get when I multiply one. this with this? 4. Four. 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 Now, so for purposes of web work or anything else, you could just put it in that way. My instincts are to simplify slightly. Mm -hmm. So I have Six 3 times 4 over, I have a 2 times 13 and another 2. So the square root of 2 squared is going to give me a 2 and then a square root of 13 here. So I feel a little happier writing it this way, but no one's going to force you to do that now. Units. Oh. This is for hour. Do the units check? Yeah. What units are on these numbers here? Meters squared. Uh-uh. Meters squared. You've got units of meters in the numerator, but you're dividing by meters. So that's unitless. And then this is in meters per hour. So this is unitless meters per hour, so you have meters per hour, which makes sense, right? That's what a rate of change of distance should be in those units. So note the comment here is that EF is unitless. And that's because you're doing displacement per per unit displacement, so the displ so the meters cancel, right? That makes sense. Okay. All right. I want to do another example. So we start to get a little closer to the flavor of some physics -y type applications, which sadly we have no physicists left. Is that right? You don't count. <laughs> Graduated. So I'm going to write down something that's going to look totally foreign to you guys. And I'm going to ask you to think about it. Suppose f is a differentiable function on the plane. And it satisfies minus y 
times the partial derivative of f with respect to x plus x times the partial derivative of f with respect to y is zero everywhere. What does this tell you about f? So we're going to have lots of ways of thinking about this. I'm sort of using this to motivate what we're going to do on Friday. On Friday, but what can we say about f? And I suppose some wise guy is going to say nothing and be happy because he answered the question. And then the same thing to y that would do to x. Oh, you're recognizing this from a homework problem yeah, you yeah, just did. Yeah. 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 What did the homework problem you just did? Where did the so from homework? So you do know how to answer the question. What was the homework problem? There was a composition. You had a problem, and I'm going to change letters for a moment here. That you had a function of x and y. So I'm changing letters compared to your homework problem. You had a function of x and y that was some function of the square root of x squared plus y squared. And you showed by doing the single variable chain rule that, the, that this function f satisfied this equation. It didn't look this way because they were on opposite sides of the equal sign, but it was this equation. All right, so my question is, how could we discover this? So there's going to be some geometry going on that we're going to talk about in a minute. But I want to suggest that we can consider the mapping given by polar coordinates, which I promised you the other day we would look at again. And I'm going to actually put r's and thetas back in just so you recognize what we're doing. Do you remember this was the mapping that went from polar coordinate space to Cartesian coordinates? And that if you're at a point x in Cartesian coordinates, that this is the angle theta, and this is the distance r, and so this is x and y, given in terms of r and theta. OK? So, Here's what I want to say. We are studying this function f that satisfies some cockamamie differential equation. But someone suggests to us that we consider polar coordinates. So that person who suggests it is taking this polar coordinates mapping here that's starting with r and theta applying the function g to it, and then applying f to it. And so the question I am asking you guys is, suppose you consider this function capital F, which is fog. Consider capital F, which is fog, namely, it's looking at the function little f in polar coordinates. So in physics, this happens a lot, but we're going to do it a ton in this course, too, where you want to change coordinate systems. You, you guys did this kind of stuff in beginning calculus where you made changes of variables and integrals and did u substitutions. This is, this is the premonition for doing all that kind of stuff. So I'm asking myself. So, what does this differential equation look like if I look at it instead in polar coordinates? So, what the, the warm-up question I want to ask you guys is, what does the chain rule tell us about the derivatives of capital F in terms of the derivatives of these guys? What is d of the composition? D. By the chain rule, what is it? D little f. D little f 
at g of, g of whatever times the derivative of, no, no, it's not prime now because I'm mapping r2 to r2. So now I'm going to have to write a d, a big d, dg of r theta. Well, what is df? Well, that's a function from r2 to r, and we're using coordinates x and y. So what's the derivative matrix of the little f? Partial respect to? And partial respect to? Y. But evaluated at g of r theta. In other words, put polar coordinates into that function. So I'll put it here. Although it gets to be, to be honest, a pain in the rump to have to write all this down all the time. So I, I, if you wrote down a note to the grader or to me that I'm writing df dx df dy where I'm evaluating at this point, I would say that's fine. In fact, I will start doing that at some point. All right, so I'm doing the partials of f. There's a 1 by 2 matrix. And now what's dg? Well, we actually did this. Yesterday, or maybe it was Monday. I think it was yesterday. What's the derivative of this mapping? Um, two by two matrix. It's like um, sine theta. 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 And then the derivative with respect to theta. Negative R negative So when I do when I'm done with this, I have a one by two matrix multiplying by a two by two. What shape is the answer going to be? Does that make sense? Yes. Makes sense because capital F takes two variables and gives you a number. So the, the, the answer should be uh, 1 by 2 matrix. And those are exactly the partials of big F with respect to the variables r and theta. And these are just evaluated r and theta. So I'm taking F here, and I'm doing capital F here, and I'm asking if I know something about little f, do I know the derivative of the composition? Namely, when I move in the r direction, what's the derivative? When I move in the theta direction, what's the derivative? Now, if you think about this in terms of what I said yesterday, it's actually going to make some nice sense. What does this say df d theta is? It says to get df d theta, I didn't mean to cross out the top df. I should take this matrix and multiply it by what? The second, the second column. And remember what we said yesterday. The second column here is the derivative of g with respect to theta. It's saying, as I vary theta here at this point, how does the composition of f with g vary? But what does g do at this point that I start at? If I vary theta fixing r, what am I doing? I'm moving on a circle. And so the partial of g with respect to theta is that tangent vector to that circle. Does that make sense to you from this formula? Uh -huh. So if I multiply df by the vector dg d theta, I'm getting the partial of capital F with respect to theta. And what is that? It's the directional derivative of f in the direction of this vector. Right? When you take df, d little f, times this vector, you're doing directional derivative in the direction of this vector, dg d theta. Well, what
what do I get when I write that down? I'm getting df, df dx times, right? I'm doing this. So I get df dx times minus r sine theta plus df dy times r cosine theta. So geometrically, I'm asking what's the directional derivative in this direction, but this is the formula for it. You see it, Matthias? What is this? And what is this? That's negative y. And that's x. How coincidental? And what did we assume about this combination of partial derivatives? That, so the original equation I wrote down was asking you understand functions that have this combination of partials equal to zero. Well, what are you now going to tell me about those functions? When you view them in polar coordinates, they're independent of the angle. They're independent of the angle. Capital F doesn't depend on theta. Therefore, it's a function of r only. This is telling me that capital F is a function of r only. Okay? As you vary theta, it doesn't affect the function. So it depends only on r. And that's exactly what you did in your homework problem. You started with a function of r. All right, so this is a very powerful technique, actually, to take what looks like very complicated differential equations and think about them in some other coordinates in which they become something simple and you can tell what the solutions are. And Mr. Video over there is nodding because he's actually had to do this dozens of times. Um, so leading to where we're going to pick up on Friday, I'd like to think about this thing, this directional derivative is multiplying this row vector, this row matrix, by the direction vector here. But again, it would be nice to think about that a little bit more geometrically. When you multiply this 1 by 2 matrix by a vector, you're really dotting it when you think of this as a vector. So where we're headed is to say it's actually going to be interesting and helpful to turn that derivative matrix on its side preview of coming attractions so you all start munching on popcorn when f maps r into r df at a point is a linear map from r n to r, i.e. a 1 by n matrix. Let's think about its transpose. Now it's a vector in r n. And it's a vector that's so important that we're going to give it a name, the gradient of f. So those of you who have seen multivariable before have seen the gradient. You've never seen the derivative as a linear map stuff. But the gradient vector of f is going to be the vector you get by taking the derivative matrix and turning it on its side. In other words, it's going to be the vector whose components are the partials of f. And we're then going to interpret that directional derivative as a dot product. And that's going to give us all sorts of fascinating concepts about what the derivative really means. So that's where we're headed.